What is up, people? Van from the Vaniverse Gaming Channel here, bringing you another video on Salasa Crown of the Magister. So now with Palace of Ice out, every DLC, the entire Salasta game is now completed. So I'm going back and redoing some of my videos. So in today's video, we are going to recover the ancestries, races, sub races, whatever you want to call it. We're going to go over each one. We're going to then at the end of the video kind of tell you what my favorite picks are. But we first want to give you a guide to the different ancestry slash races. And then at the end, I will tell you why I would choose certain races over all the rest. So without further ado, let's get started. So first up, we have the dwarf. So the dwarf is a shorter race, so their movement is always going to be one less than some of the normal humanoid size. Uh, they get a plus two on their constitution. They get saving throws against poison, resistance to poison. They are proficient with battle axes, hand axes, and war hammers, and they have the heavy armor training, which allows them to be unaffected by penalties of heavy armor. So penalties of heavy armor is your movement is affected, and also your stealth is also affected. So there's some penalties you get that they don't have to follow. Now, the Hill Dwarf is one of the two sub-races or sub-ancestries in Salasta, and with the Hill Dwarf, you're going to get a plus one to your wisdom, you're going to get a plus one to your hit points every level. You can see in the dark with dark vision, and you can speak common and dwarvish. So that is what the hill dwarf provides. Now if we move over to the snow dwarf, their movement is going to be the same. Everything up here is going to be the same. But now you get a plus one to dexterity instead of plus one to wisdom. So this makes them a little bit more suited for a non-cleric druid type class and more maybe a fighter, uh, you know, a rogue, a ranger, that kind of thing. They are proficient with heavy crossbows, which is really nice. And then they have dark vision and you can see along with Palace of Ice, well, they have a plus two to con save, which is really good. But with the Palace of Ice DLC, you're in the cold weather a lot. And now just being a snow dwarf, you have immunity to the cold weather and you have immunity to the frozen condition, which just came out with the recent DLC. Now we're gonna skip Dragonborn, Rock Gnome, and Half Orc, because we wanna cover the eight races and sub races that are in the base game, and then we'll cover what you get in each DLC. So we're gonna jump over to the Half Elf. Now the Half Elf, you can see his movement is six, which is basically times five, so 30 speed is what he would have. So you can basically move six squares on the map. What makes the Half-Elf very different to the other Ancestries races is they actually get four ability score increases instead of three. They get a two in Charisma and they get one in two other abilities, which makes them fairly unique. Then when you get to their bonus skills, they can get two additional skills that no other uh, race gets. They have Dark Vision. They have Saving Throws against Charm and Immunity to Magical Sleep with Fey Ancestry since they're part Elf. And then they also can speak these languages. So then we'll move into the humans. So the human has the same movement speed as a half elf because they're half elf, half human. They get plus one to all ability scores. So you just throw a flat plus one on everything. This could be good and could be bad depending on what kind of build that you want to make. But other than that, they have nothing special about them. And the key is... They're one of the only race ancestry options in the game that does not have dark vision. And so lighting is very important in Solasta. And if you don't have dark vision, then you really need to make sure you're lighting torches and you're providing different light sources, or it's really going to put you at a disadvantage. So then we're going to step over to the elf. So right out of the gate, your elf gets plus two to dexterity. They have the Fey Ancestry that we got with the Half-Elf. They have Dark vision, vision. They have Keen Sense, which means they're proficient with Perception, which is a great skill in D&D in general, let alone Solasta. And then they only have to meditate for four hours to rest instead of taking a full eight-hour long rest. The High Elf is one of the sub-ancestries or sub-races. You get a plus one intelligence from being a High Elf. You gain proficiency in Long Sword, Short Sword, Short Bow, and Long Bow. You also gain a High Elf cantrip. So you get one Wizard cantrip where you can use your intelligence as a spell modifier, which is really nice for some classes that if you want to just throw a, a Firebolt at something, that's really nice to have it for free. And then as uh, for language, you get these languages. So that is what the High Elf brings. 
Then if we move over to the Sylvan Elf, this is what makes them pretty special is they have a seventh movement speed so they can move faster than any other sub race or ancestry in the game. And you get a plus one to your wisdom. So you can imagine the High Elf is more for intelligence based characters and the Sylvan Elf is more for druidic, uh, druidic, maybe even ranger kind of type characters. Uh, they get the same elven weapon proficiencies as the as the high elf does, but then they get this uh, they're proficient in survival and athletics, and they have advantage on survival and uh, uh, when hunting. So this is really good when you're traveling on the world travel map, when you're traveling between locations in gathering food. The reason why that's important is you can only long rest if you have enough food. And so if your characters don't have enough food when you're traveling between places on the world map, you won't be able to long rest, which can actually hurt you if you hit a random encounter. So it's kind of an advantage. And then they have the same languages that you get with some of the others. So that is the elf and their sub races slash ancestries. So finally, we'll get to the halfling. So we'll start off with the halfling in general. They have the same movement speed as another short race like the dwarf. They get a plus two to dexterity like the elves do. They have the ability called Brave, where they have advantage on saving throws against being frightened. There's actually several creatures and spells in this game that use the frightened condition, so this is beneficial for that. You also get a lucky feat when you roll a 1 on attack roll, ability check, or saving throw, re-roll, and use a new roll. So every time you roll a 1, you get to re-roll it with the hopes that you're going to do better and pass, which is great. And then you have Halfling Nimbleness, where you can move through the space of any creature that is, that is of a larger size than you. So normally you cannot move through an enemy creature unless they are two sizes larger than you. With the halfling, they only have to be one size larger than you. So a medium-sized humanoid, like any other uh, ancestry race in the game, you can actually move through that. And then when we talk about the sub-races, first is the marsh halfling. So this gives you constitution plus one. You also gain some languages. When you're in swamps that are areas with marshes and ponds, they are considered swamp terrain. So if you are a ranger, it's kind of that whole which terrain you're proficient in. So this is kind of one of the things where they just automatically get it. And then you have dark vision as well. So the key thing to note about them uh, is really this, some of these abilities you get. But as a marsh halfling, there's really nothing special other than the plus one. So then when we get to the island halfling, you get the same stuff you did, but now with the island, you get plus one to your charisma. And then you also get this ability to have advantage on dexterity checks or acrobatics. So if in the game there's an acrobatics check, you actually get a advantage on passing that roll, which I don't think happens all that often. So those are the base races that came with the game. So if you purchase their first DLC, which is called the Primal Calling DLC, that will then unlock the half-orc. The half-orc gets a plus two to strength, plus one to constitution. They have dark vision. They get an ability called menacing, which makes them proficient in intimidation, which there are some roles where you're going to try and intimidate somebody, so this can come in handy in some of the dialogue. Then you get this thing called relentless endurance, which is amazing, where if you get one-shotted and you're going to go down below one hit point and be unconscious, you actually go down to one hit point instead. And so this usually gives you the a chance to have someone heal you or heal yourself or get off another attack before you die. And then you have savage attacks where when you critical hit, you roll an additional critical die. So most times when you do a critical hit, you roll two damage dice instead of one. In this case, you would roll three damage dice instead of two. Then if you purchase the inner strength DLC, you will unlock the dragonborn. Very similar where you get a plus two to strength, plus one to charisma. You get to choose your draconic ancestry. So this is a lot like the, uh, the, the draconic patron or subclass for the sorcerer, where once you pick your dragon of choice or your color, then that gives you resistances to that type. So if you pick black, then you have damage resistance to acid, et cetera, et cetera. You also gain a breath weapon for that same one. So if you pick black, you would be able to breathe acid. Um, so that's what makes these guys pretty special is they get a, a breath weapon and they get damage resistance to a specific type on top of their strength and charisma. Now the Palace of Ice DLC. So when the Palace of Ice DLC came out, you have the gnome has been unlocked. So they are a short race like the dwarf and the halfling where they only have a movement of five. They get dark vision. 
They also get this Gnome Cunning, which has the advantage on all intelligence, wisdom, and charisma saving throws against magic, which is really important. And then they get a plus two to intelligence. Then if you choose the Rock Gnome Subrace, you get a plus one to your dexterity. You get the Tinker ability, which gives you proficiency in Smith's tools. And it takes you a quarter of the time to make those basic items that you would make with the tools. And you get to double your proficiency bonus. So pretty much if you're making any non-magical stuff that requires Smith's tools, then you're going to make it extremely fast. And then they also get Artificer's Lore, where when you make an intelligence check or a history check, you can add twice your proficiency bonus. So there are probably a lot of history checks in the original campaign. I can't remember, maybe some in Lost Valley. Um, so this will just help you learn more about things as you progress through the game. Then you can choose the Shadow Gnome option. So this option is one of those customized uh, sub races. And basically you get the same plus one dexterity, but now you're proficient in stealth, stealth. So you get to add your plus two, plus three, whatever proficiency bonus when you roll stealth checks. And you know the annoying bee cantrip where you use intelligence as your spell casting ability. So this is kind of nice to annoy people to break concentration, that kind of thing. Um, but that's what you get with this sub race of the note. And then the other race that was added during the Palace of Ice DLC is the Tiefling. Your movement seed is six because you're a standard size humanoid, medium. You have dark vision. You have hellish resistance, so you gain resistance to fire damage. You get plus two to your charisma, plus one to your intelligence, and you get this infernal legacy. So you automatically know the produce faint flame cantrip. At level three, you learn hellish rebuke. At level five, you learn the darkness. And each one of these can be cast one time before you finish a long rest, and then it resets. And the Hellish Rebuke is at level 2. All the other ones are at their normal level, like Darkness is the normal level spell. And you use your Charisma as your spellcasting ability for these spells. So that covers all of the races, sub-races, ancestries, whatever you want to call them, that are present in Solasta and will be till the end of time because the game is completely created they are not going to make any more uh, content updates to the game and so now that you know all of the different options i'd like to go into each one and kind of explain to you what makes them special and what my favorite race ancestry to play and what classes it fits so let's talk about first the dwarf to me the Snow Dwarf is probably the most powerful race, sub-race in the game. The ability to have resistance to poison damage and saving throws against poison, to be unaffected by heavy armor, to then have proficiency with a heavy crossbow, and dark vision, and plus two to your con saving throws, and immunity to cold weather, like this is by far the Chad of the group, right? The Hill Dwarf is also very strong, um, but not near as strong as the Snow Dwarf. If I were to pick a whole party of Snow Dwarves, I would be happy with that. I think coming in at number two, a really strong race is going to be the Half Orc, especially if you're playing one of those strength based characters. The ability to have relentless endurance and only drop to one hit point is amazing, especially if you're kind of the tank of the party. And then the Savage Attacks, if you're going to build a Half-Orc, you're probably going to build a class that you want to crit on. And getting that extra crit jam damage is just so very, very satisfying. I think the next best race, in my opinion, would probably be the Sylvan Elf. The reason I picked this is because their ability to have 7 movement speed. It's amazing how movement speed is so important in this game to be able to get further, especially when you're using Long Strider and some of those things with like the Ranger. This is probably my third favorite um, class, race sub-race. I think you can't go wrong with half-elves. Um, they just provide a lot with the two charisma plus the two other ability scores and then having the immunity to magical sleep. But really, if you're talking elf, the high elf is really strong for casters. So if I were to kind of break it up by class and I would say, okay, if I am playing any kind of melee based or range based character i think the snow dwarf is where i would go same with like a tank any even if you're talking a cleric or a druid i would choose snow dwarf because of the plus two the constitution saving throw in order to maintain concentration 
you have to roll a constitution saving throw and beat a 10. So you're automatically gaining plus two to that. So it just makes it to where you don't have to take feats to help with flawless concentration. And if you pump up your constitution, because you're already getting a plus two to constitution, you really have a good chance of passing your concentrations if you're a spellcaster that uses concentration. And honestly, this new DLC, it's almost like it's amazing because you don't have to you don't have to attune to gear to give you the cold resistance that you would normally have to do if you weren't a snow dwarf. Uh, Hill dwarf is probably really good for like clerics and druids if you want to go that route. The whole heavy armor proficiency thing, I mean, you're not going to deal with druids, so probably it fits a cleric real well. Dragonborn, I mean, you can't go wrong with a paladin as a dragonborn because of their strength and charisma. Uh, those are really the main classes. A sorcerer might be good. It's kind of redundant if you go the draconic sorcerer, but you could maybe do a dragonborn draconic sorcerer and it just fit the theme and it'd work out pretty well. When we talk about gnomes, I really don't think the shadow gnome does much. I really don't think the rock gnome does much. I feel like there's a lot of characters that it might fit from maybe an arcane trickster type rogue. So in this case, I think it's called a shadow caster or something. Um, so that might work where you have a spell casting rogue. Uh, but other than that, maybe a caster in general, a wizard or something of the sort would fit the gnome because of the plus two intelligence and the one dexterity. Because dexterity will help with your armor class since you're a caster. You can't wear medium or heavy armor. So could be good to go with that. I mean, the stealth proficiency plus the dex and the intelligence would be great for that casting rogue. It also could work out for a regular rogue if you want to put the intelligence to something else. Uh, so pretty good there. You could also even go a uh, warrior that is a dex-based warrior. That could be fun. Uh, and do the spell casting warrior as well. In this case, I'm sorry, fighter. Um, half elf, you know, obviously the two charisma, they're great for sorcerers, great for paladins, great for warlocks. Um, so they could fit all of that. Same with the dragonborn because of the one charisma, you could go warlock. Uh, the plus two strength could give you a great melee warlock if you go pact of the pact of the blade. Uh, so there's a lot of options there. So as I said, the half orc, almost a must for a strength based character that you're going to want to get up and do a lot of damage. I love playing half-orc barbarians, half-orc fighters, half-orc rangers. Heck, even half-orc <clears throat> rogues work out pretty good. However, the crits work better with, like, the two-handed axe. So if you're going to go rogue, maybe go a hoodlum rogue could be fun. Uh, where you're using your two-handed axe, um, that could be great. But, yeah, I would almost always pick a half-orc if I'm playing a barbarian, and I really like them with the ranger. And then human, I mean, humans are just okay. I never, I don't think I've ever played a human in Solasta because I really hate the fact they don't have dark vision and it just makes things so much easier. But other than that, the plus one ability score, depending on if you're rolling, taking standard array or all of that, it could be good. And if you just want to play a human, you can just play a human. But, you know, this is a fantasy game, so play something more fun, in my opinion. All right, and then we'll go to the tiefling. Again, Two charisma, one intelligence, fantastic warlock, fantastic sorcerer. Could even be a great paladin. You know, having the additional hellish rebuke on top of a warlock's pretty good. Just all of those different things. The darkness spell fits real well with the warlock. I mean, tiefling warlock, 100%. But you could also get away with a sorcerer. And, you know, even a bard because of the intelligence plus one, this would be a great bard. I believe the same would go for the, um, the gnome here. You could even go bard on one of these two because that could fit into their using some intelligence and some charisma. So just keep that in mind. But tiefling, great warlock, bard, sorcerer, that kind of thing. I feel like the dragonborn is better for a paladin than the tiefling would be, but you could potentially do a paladin. Uh, high elf, you know, this is where you get, it's great for your wizards and for your sorcerers, your, your pure spellcasters, just because of the intelligence and the dexterity. Um, also having proficiency in bows could be very helpful with some of your cantrips. You know, some things are immune to it, like cold or fire. So being able to shoot a bow is helpful. Um, having that extra cantrip just gives you more abilities to have a more diverse cantrip amount. So I think that's where this one shines is as a wizard would be great. Maybe even a sorcerer, um, probably a bard could work too because of the dexterity and the intelligence for sure. And then we get to the Sylvan Elf. I mean, this calls Ranger. This calls Ranger 100%. It 
You could do, you know, maybe a deck space paladin for this. Um, there's a lot of other options you could choose, but really the Sylvan Elf makes a ranger amazing. Maybe even a druid would be a good choice because of the dexterity for your AC and then the wisdom. Another great Sylvan Elf. Um, so those are some of the the classes that probably fit well with this race subrace. And then when you get into the halfling, again, constitution dexterity, this could be great on rangers, this can be great on rogues, fighters. I mean, those are two great stats to have if you're doing a dexterity-based melee character. So even if you go fighter and you want to go two-hand or dual-wield dexterity-based weapons, you can. So a lot of options here. Um, the, the dark vision and all that, like the lucky is great to have brave is great to have so these are all really good for like a melee up in your face fighter and same with this being able to move through characters right if you're the melee or you're the tank and you want to get in there being able to walk through and and position yourself really helps out as well and then lastly we'll get to the island halfling the island halfling and the human i don't think i've ever played because again neither of them have dark vision and it makes me crazy and really i mean this would be a good bard obviously it could fit a, a sorcerer, it could fit a, you know, a warlock as well. But the lack of dark vision is a pain in my butt. Now, if you do go warlock, you can just get the ability to see with your devil sight, so that's helpful. But otherwise, you're constantly looking for dark vision rings, which are pretty easy to buy now. I think the vendors sell them and they're not too expensive. So you can pick one of those up pretty quick. And then there's also certain spell scrolls and light spells and things like that you can use. It just makes it more annoying to do that. And I think the Dragonborn is one of the other ones that also does not have Dark Vision, so just keep that in mind. If you're playing a Dragonborn, you don't have Dark Vision with that. So those are the races, ancestries, sub-races, whatever you want to call them. The ones in the base game, the ones in the, uh, in the DLCs and kind of my choices. But 100% best race, ancestry, sub-race in the entire game to me is the Snow Dwarf. You just can't go wrong with it. So... That is my opinion. I hope you guys like this video. I hope it is an improvement from the previous video since I now have all of the races and sub races for the entire game and all the DLCs. And we will continue to update all of my videos on classes, feats, everything else that I uh, think are out of date at this point. Appreciate you guys watching. Thanks. Put your comments below. Give it a like if you like it. And we'll see you in the next video. Cheers and peace out. <music>